There is this moment of high tension in the history of uh, Judah, the two tribes, the southern kingdom, when they are facing invasion from two of the surrounding kingdoms. And the king, King Ahaz, is making his arrangements to defend the kingdom. And the prophet Isaiah comes to the king and, and says to him, ask for a sign that God is with you. And this is something that has happened before. God has given a sign that God is with the people. And um, so what, was this, what sign would you request? And King Ahaz does something that sounds polite, but it really actually isn't. He says, oh, I, would never, I could never ask that. You know how when someone asks, can, you, can I give you a hand, and you, you do the very Midwestern thing, and say, oh, no, never mind, I'm okay, even when you're not. Right? That's what's happening here. The, the prophet has shown up to say, God's going to be with you. God, God is here to give a hand. Just ask, and, and, and God's going to show you. And, and King Ahaz goes, oh, no, no, I could never. No. And the prophet, knowing he was being blown off, shoot away, says, well, you're going to have a sign, and here is the sign you will have. A child shall be born, and before that child is old enough to know right from wrong, the kingdoms that now invade will be deserted. Now, this is a different type of sign that has been given before. If you look at back at, like, for example, at Judges, when uh, Gideon needs a sign, is, it, is when he wakes up in the morning, is the fleece wet or the ground wet? That's pretty fast acting. When uh, Elijah uh, faces off against the 400 prophets of Baal, it's, again, another fast acting sign. They can't get their offering to light up. Elijah can. Bam, right there. Pretty fast acting. This is not a fast acting sign. This is a child will be born. Oh, oh, okay, that's good. Let me put that on my calendar for nine months from now. Like this is not happening anytime quickly, right? Isaiah the prophet is the one that God entrusts with much of what we know is fulfilled in Jesus. Isaiah, we read from Isaiah all month long during this season of Advent. We used to hear uh, the people who have walked in darkness will find a great light. The rod of oppression will be broken. He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is where we hear that refrain that when this king reigns, this child that will be born, that the wolf will lie down the lamb and the calf or the, the lion. Like, this is all what we start hearing. I, Isaiah is the prophet that tells us what we need to know to make sense uh, of this, uh, this season. Later on in Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, as, he's, as this is all moving forward, he gives this line that has been held on to for centuries now. God tells the people, I am about to do a new thing. It springs forth. Do you see it? Do you perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness. There will be rivers in the desert. This new thing. And we are tempted to want to rush towards that, to have that fulfilled and have that happen right now. But this is Advent. And Advent is a season that takes its sweet time. Advent is not in a hurry. Everything else is telling you to go shopping. When? Yesterday. Right? How? As much as you can. The rest of everything is in a hurry, right? You know what Advent is? Advent's going to get there when it gets there. Kind of like that sign, right? When does a child show up? When a child chooses to show up. And it's going to be a while, right? I, there's sort of an, I think there's a, an echo of that, right? I think Advent's a bit, honestly, I, I think Advent's a bit too long for my tastes, but I, that's kind of a pale echo of, uh, anyone here ever been pregnant? You hit about week, week 36, and what are you thinking? Right? I, I, I've watched pregnancy up close a few times now, and those last weeks are just, right? That's Advent. Right? It's just going to take a while. And I think that's part of understanding the pacing here. We, it, it's tempting to go straight to the, I'm going to do a new thing. Do you perceive it? Right? That, that's, but that's not the start of the chapter. And if we're going to read this, we've got to read the whole context, the whole chapter. So let's, let's get into this and let's understand it in, in context here. 
this chapter where it talks about the new thing, it begins by saying, Thus says the Lord, He who formed you, do not fear, for I have called you by name, and you are mine. Which is going to be important to remember, because what they hear next is, When you pass, notice when, not if, but when. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flame will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. I gave Egypt as your ransom, because you are precious in my sight. I love you, and I give people in return for you, so do not fear. I will say to the north, gather up my people, and from the south do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Then we get to this line. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Can you see it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You can't get to the new thing right away. The new thing happens after you've passed through the waters and gone through the fire. Right? Remember, this is Isaiah we're listening to. When Isaiah gives a sign, Isaiah doesn't do something right that day. Isaiah starts something that doesn't come to fruition for nine months. It's going to take a while. Right? Uh, all the Methodists in, in Missouri, all the Methodist pastors get this magazine from the conference office, and in the front of it recently was a letter from the bishop, Bob Farr. And he started by pointing this out, that we're, we're beginning this new year, and we turn and we look at Isaiah and how he appreciates uh, the, the challenge there. I say appreciate, but I don't, I don't think appreciate is quite the right term. I appreciate this in the same way I appreciate a nice salad while there are leftover taters in the fridge, right? Left or Thanksgiving. Like, it's good, it's healthy, it's probably the right thing to do, but appreciate might not be quite right. The point being, when Bob Farr talks about how we're going to have to take our time, you don't know Bob Farr. You know what the most important word Bob Farr added to the mission of the Methodist Conference, he added the word relentless, right? Just think of a man who gets in charge and says, we need to talk about relentless. This dude is, he's doing something. I don't know if I've ever seen him sitting still, at least voluntarily, right? And so for Bob Farr to say, you know what, we're going to have to slow down, I thought, wow, that's something. And he points out, we have been pondering this for a long time, the nature of Advent. There's a fellow named uh, Pierre Chardin. He's a French fellow, passed away in 1955. Here's what he writes about the, this sort of understanding of, of how time flows. He writes, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything. We want to reach the end without delay. We would like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown and something new, and yet it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability, and that might take a very long time. And so I think it is with you. Your ideas mature gradually. Let them grow. Let them shape themselves without undue haste. Don't try to force them on as though you could be today what time will make of you tomorrow. Time, that is to say, grace and circumstances acting upon us. Only God can say what this new spirit gradually forming within us will be. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that his hand is leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. I don't like that. Accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. Now, I'm turning 40 in January, and I thought by now I would be figured, right? I thought I'd have my life complete. I thought I would know what I was doing, and it'd be worked out. And at that point, I'd just be doing it, right? Here I am. I figured it out. Off I go. Ugh. <laughs> yeah. 
to accept the anxiety of knowing that I am in suspense and incomplete. You know, it's in our names. We are Methodists, not nowadists, not instantadists. We are Methodists, which means that we acknowledge that there is a method, and methods take time. In that spirit, naming that we are incomplete and trusting that we are following God's lead, we are now beginning a new year, right? This is the beginning of the church year, and we're looking down the road, and tonight, Honeywell Methodist Church is having its planning meeting for the next 12 months, and this Wednesday, our board is gathering, and we're looking down the road at our goals and what are we focused on, and so accepting that we are incomplete, there is much that we have to grapple with and deal with. Here is where we stand. This is my analysis of sort of the state of the church, knowing that this is the start of a process, that this, we're, this is, we're reading this in the context of Isaiah. Things take time. First, I gotta tell you that this church has some significant and amazing strengths. We have begun experimenting over these last few years. How many new classes, new meals, and new events have we tried? Y'all have tried some new things. That's very cool. We're trying new things, and that is a strength to be able to do that. This church has an amazing staff. They get along. They do what they need to do, and that is awesome, right? The board here is full of good people who take the leadership of this church seriously. We have some strong people rotating off. We have some strong people rotating on. This church has a very strong governance. And we like to eat together. I can't wait to eat with y'all. And y'all seem to enjoy it too. That's a great strength. Our buildings are in good shape and our, our finances are, are stable. Like we, in general, th th there's some real strengths to this church. There are some weaknesses that we have to grapple with. No one here is getting any younger. Our youth program continues to need development. We're still working on that. In the community perception of us as a church, that takes time to change. Right? That does take time. And so based on those strengths and weaknesses, we have some risks and we have some opportunities. The risks, mainly, uh, there's one risk that we can control. At some point, we may need a new parsonage. And you all know how hard it is to find a house around here. <laughs> uh, the other risks are really beyond our control. We continue to face the pressures that rural America faces. If the stock market turns, it will impact our fiscal stability. And next year, in uh, general, there will be a general conference of the church that will change the future of the Methodist Church. In Minneapolis in 2020, uh, in May, I believe, I will be there, and I will watch it. And, and I, told, I told my dad a few years ago, we were talking about retirement. That's what I do with my dad, I guess. We talk about serious matters. And um, I told my dad, I'm not going to retire from the same church that I joined. I know things will change at some point. I did not expect that to come true quite so fast. <laughs> so that is a risk, and we're going to have to handle that as it unfolds. There are also some amazing opportunities. When I call the school over here, the school wants to play with us. That's awesome. It is such an opportunity to, to be able to work with them, and that I'm looking forward to what will come of that. Also, uh, Shalbina is a stable community. There is no confusion about where our harvest is. The harvest is out there to be gotten, and it's just right outside those doors. There are people who need to experience and hear the good news of Jesus Christ, and they need to hear it especially... Well, 2020 is going to be an interesting year, isn't it? More than just a Methodist church. It's going to be an interesting year in America. There is an opportunity here for us. Where else in Shelbina do people sit down together that vote differently out there, but get together here and say Jesus is Lord? Right? This is a place where what's important is Jesus, and to be able to share that with people out there in the midst of what could be a very tense year to say, this is where we find some peace and this is what we hold on to. That is an opportunity. We need to hold on to it. We need to make sure to offer it to others as well. Now that's what I see, the strengths and weaknesses, the risks and opportunities. If I'm missing anything, please tell me. Like I, I whatever I am missing, because I am missing something. <laughs> 
What I expect as we go forward is that we will continue to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ, uh, what this uh, fellow Chardin calls the intermediate stages. We continue to, to live in that time, and, and we continue to grow. When I first got here, one-third of the church was involved in some something beyond worship to grow in their faith, and now it's up to half. Half of you are involved in some sort of Bible study or, or something outside of worship, and that's very cool. We are only as strong as we grow, and you are growing in your faith. That's a beautiful thing. What I expect is as a church, there will be further opportunities to offer hospitality to Shelbina. We did a fish fry last year. I'm already excited about doing it again. And we'll do some other events like that. Smaller ones. <laughs> what I expect is that as a church, we will become more comfortable with inviting people to join us as we grow. Uh, on December 15th, we're going to have cookies and carols here. Uh, the youth group is going to be involved. I've, the children from aftercare will be involved. Please bake some cookies. I didn't explicitly say that in the newsletter. I need you to bake cookies. And then invite people to come and share them. And know that it's going to be a good time. I expect that the challenges we face will be exactly that, challenging. General Conference 2020 will be a challenge. I don't know what that will bring. But here is what the bishop asks of me and what the bishop asks of us. Based upon being in this time of Advent, based upon reading Isaiah, based upon what we've covered. Here, here is what the bishop asks of us. Stay at the table. All right? Here's how the bishop puts it. Bishop Farr puts it, the worst thing Judas ever did was he left the table. Right? Stay at this table with us. Right? Stay at this table. <laughs> Second thing, the bishop asks is stay at this table together, knowing that we're going to disagree about the stuff out there, but we are here together, and what is most important is Jesus is Lord. And we gather around that. And the third thing the bishop asks of us <clears throat> is to stay focused on the mission of the church. The mission of every Methodist church is the same. Make disciples of Jesus Christ to transform the world. That's why we exist. We exist so each of us might be disciples, that we might go out and be able to invite other people to join us in this amazing path, this path that leads to light and hope and joy. And in the end, we, tr we do this trusting and knowing that it will change our world. It begins here, it goes out there. Because we worship Jesus here, Shalbina is a more graceful, peaceful, and reconciled place. Let everything else happen. Maybe we control it, maybe we can't. We stay together at this table, we follow Jesus, we make disciples. That's what we can do. I look forward to doing it with you in the coming year. Amen.